another episode of Ask Seek and Knock. Um, my name is Ina Carr and I'm the host uh, of the show. And we have in this episode, we have two episodes. The first one is uh, with my husband here, Dr. Thomas Carr, a uh, theologian, a philosopher. Right? Yes, yes. And so th this show, we're going to talk about anything pertaining to the Catholic Church, Catholic teaching, saints, uh, prayer life, anything. Anything goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> And in the second half of the show, we will have Father Ignatius Schweitzer, and he's a Dominican priest. So, but the first one, we will talk about different things with Dr. Carr, Thomas Carr, mm -hmm. and maybe you want to open up in prayer? Sure. First? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Welcome to everybody that's joining us. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you for this time we have to gather together to talk about issues of the faith, theology, history, saints, and so on. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide our words, that they would anoint every word that we say, that it would uh, enable those that listen to strengthen their faith and to grow in the knowledge and love of God. And we want to turn this time over to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, today is going to be an interesting topic. Uh, it's going to follow last week. You talk about St. John Henry Newman, one of yeah. your most influential saint. One of my favorite saints. Favorite, yeah. And uh, one who was... Um, probably has had the most influence on my life, shaped my faith helped me to become a Catholic. And as I start to move back into um, more of a teaching and writing mode, I feel like his spirit is helping He's me as well. Back. It's coming back. He's coming, coming back. He's coming back to haunt you yeah. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Okay, so um, you want to talk a bit about his life, um, about his conversion as being a very famous conversion, right? Yeah. That yeah. actually helped you convert. And how well was he received in the Catholic Church? Mm. Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about John Henry Newman last week, last time we met, and we didn't really get that far because there really is a lot to say about his, both his life and his, his teachings. Um, so he was, John Henry Newman was born right at the very beginning of the 1800s, 1801, I believe, and he lived almost the entirety of that century, 90, 90 years old when he died. Uh, he was born into a a Christian family, an Anglican family, and it was what we would call a broad church family or low church family. They were very devout, but they did not really put much emphasis on the rituals or the, uh, the ceremonial of the Anglican faith. When he went to college and he studied at Oxford University, he came under the influence of a, a couple of what we might call high church Anglicans, pastors or priests who really took the, the Catholic side of the Anglican faith very seriously. They had devotion to Mary, they used incense and Gregorian chant during the like masses. The Latin masses very, it was like a solemn high mass solemn every high single mass, day. Yeah. Really were very, very high church. And Newman loved it. He, he felt his faith coming alive in that environment. And so he became himself a high church Anglican and then he became a, a tutor at Oxford and a chaplain as well, chaplain of Oriel College, my, my alma mater. And while he was chaplain, he founded and became the leader of a movement called the Oxford Movement. And it was really a, 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 an effort on his part to make the Anglican Church a lot more like the Catholic Church. He wanted to move the Anglican Church in both its doctrine, its morality, and the way they worship to become more and more like the Catholic Church. See, Newman had this theory that there were the sort of three tracks in Christianity. You had the Catholic track, which ancient traditions going back to the apostles has uh, a centralized government, has um, ceremonial worship and a devotion to Mary. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Protestant track. Scripture-based, no centralized worship, um, no devotion to Mary, and really Bible is kind of their only sacrament. And then he saw the Anglican Church as a middle way. He called it the middle way between those two 
what he thought were extremes. And then Newman decided, or he took it upon himself, or I think he was actually assigned to do this, he wanted to write a, a, a treatise on the Arian controversy of the fourth century. So if you go back to the fourth century, we learned that there was a huge crisis in the church. We're, we're in a crisis in our church today, of course, for some very different reasons. But back then it was also a massive crisis. Many, many bishops had come under the spell of the teaching of this guy Arius. And he was claiming that Jesus wasn't really God. Jesus was an adopted son of God, like a very special prophet, but not divine. And it, it won, I don't know how it won the day, but it really did. The majority of bishops were coming, coming along uh, and seeing things his way. And, and then there was this sort of middle group that were, well, they, they, we call them semi-Arians. They decided that Jesus wasn't, um, certainly was more than just an adopted son of God, but he wasn't quite as much as some of the traditional Catholics were claiming him to be, and that is that he's of the very substance of God. They just claimed that he was very much like God. The homoousios is the Greek term for uh, what the Catholics use, what the Orthodox uh, traditional Catholics use to, do, to say that Jesus is cut from the same fabric as God. He is from the same substance, has the same essence. And if you insert a little I in that word, instead of homoousios, homoousios, it changes the meaning from the same substance to like substance. So those are the semi-Pelagians, right? Trying to carve out the middle way. And so he's, he's writing this, this treatise and he says, wait a minute now. The, the Catholic Church today is the, the church in the fourth century that upheld the traditional doctrine. They were the right. They were in the right, right? The Arians were clearly heretics. They had totally denied the orthodox doctrine about Jesus. And then he saw that, and, and th so those are the Protestants today. Mm -hmm. Catholics in the right, Protestants clearly wrong. And then he thought, wait a minute, this middle way, that looks a lot like the Anglicans. So wait, the Catholic Church held up true orthodoxy. The Protestants were heretics. The Anglicans also heretics because they were compromising on the fullness of the Catholic faith. <laughs> so that, that really moved him closer and closer to becoming a Catholic. Now, last time we met, last week, we talked about the book that he wrote that helped him become a Catholic. It was kind of the, the last straw on the camel's back that finally broke his resistance against the church. He wrote this book on the development of doctrine, and he developed a, a sevenfold theory for how the Catholic Church could teach so many doctrines that you don't find explicitly in Scripture but are clearly part of the deposit of faith. And his theory for that became the development of doctrine, of classic text of Newman. And as soon as he got it published, he became a Catholic. So he became a Catholic. He'd spent several weeks in this um, little community just outside of Oxford called Little, Littlemore. And there was a little Catholic monastery there just outside of Littlemore. And that's where he was kind of holding up. He was attending Mass as an Anglican, not receiving communion, but he was attending the Catholic Mass and he was reading Catholic books and he was writing this development of doctrine. And then uh, one rainy night, there was a knock on his door and it was a little priest, a little passionist priest. Oh, yes. Yeah? I know who that is. Yeah, uh, pa Father Bar Barberi, okay. who is a very saintly man. Dominic. And uh, Father Dominic Barberi. And he, uh, Newman invited Father in, got him warmed up, gave him a cup of tea. Do you know that he's been praying to convert England? Is all that his right? Life, all his life. Oh, I, I guess I'm sure I read yes. that somewhere, but I yes. don't remember that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, very good. Um, and so they got chatting, and Newman was explaining kind of where he was at with the Catholic Church, and Barberi simply asked him, well, what, what's going to stop you from becoming a Catholic tonight? How about now? <laughs> How about right now? <laughs> and Newman said, well, you know what? I can't think of anything that would stop me because all, all of his reservations cognitively 
had already fallen into place through the study about the Arians and the study about the development of doctrine. But I think his heart had been a Catholic for a long time, many, many years. And so he got on his knees, made his first confession, was received into the church that night. Yeah. You, you can actually go to Littlemore, that, that old monastery is still there, still standing, and you can go into the little room where Newman and Barberi had their conversation and where Newman knelt to receive. Is there a place where he knelt? There is, yeah. There is a little plaque and there's a kneeler oh, okay. there with yeah. information. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Um, so, in terms of conversion, I know that it was not easy for him. He told me about that. How? Yeah, it was not. Um, the, one, the one good thing about Newman was that even before he became a Catholic, he had already won many converts to the Catholic Church because he was, as an Anglican, he was becoming so Catholic, like more Catholic than the Catholics. And his stance on these uh, Anglican doctrines that he was, you know, if there's always a little subtle difference between the Anglicans and the Catholics, Newman would f favor the Catholics. Mm. And that won many Anglicans to the Catholic faith. Hundreds of students were becoming... So he was still Anglican and people are converting with that? Yeah, him? yeah, exactly. So he was kind of like, <laughs> you know, letting everybody Go. cross over. <laughs> and, and he was like the last guy to swim across, but he did. And so the interesting thing about Newman is that the, the Anglican Church never really knew what to do with John Henry Newman because he was not Anglican enough. He was too Catholic for them. He became a Catholic, and then the Catholic Church didn't quite know what to do with Newman because, in their opinion, and this is, really says more about the Catholic Church of his day than about Newman, but the Catholic Church didn't, they, they didn't um, trust him very much. They thought he was still too Protestant in some respects. And today, frankly, Newman would be considered uh, a very strong traditionalist Catholic very devout Catholic, very Orthodox Catholic. But in his day, some of his ideas were a little bit too progressive for some, for some Catholics. Now, for example, Newman had a whole treatise on the, uh, on the laity of the Catholic faith. Newman felt that the laity ought to be more involved and more active in their, in their devotions and the Catholic Church was set up in that day such that you know if you would you would say your rosary at home you would take communion at mass and then that was really about it for your day-to-day -day devotion today we've got you know the Legion of Mary and we've got Knights of Columbus and we've got all kinds of these lay apostolates that Dominican. you can Domin yeah, lay Dominicans we've we, they had late orders in his day too but uh, the the there were no men's groups, there were no women's groups, there were no Bible studies. There was nothing really for the laity to, to, um, strength, to use to strengthen their faith. And so Newman saw that as, as a problem in the Catholic faith, and the hierarchy didn't see it that way <laughs> in Newman's day. And the other thing that was going on in the church in Newman's day was that the, the Catholic church, for a lot of good reasons, were trying to uh, strengthen the authority of the papacy. The authority structure of the Catholic Church has always been centered on the papacy and then the cardinals and then the bishops and then your your pastors. But uh, a lot of the centralized authority had been dispersed out to the bishops and they were starting, they were, you were starting to see some differences of doctrine and practice in the Catholic Church. Catholic Church has always been uh, fairly uniform in its approach to the faith. So one correction to that was to, to re-emphasize the authority of the papacy. And so that was going on in Newman's day. And Newman wasn't quite on board with that. He, he kind of liked the idea of um, maybe a more democratic approach to, to the faith. So, yeah, so, that, so the Catholic Church wasn't quite sure what to do with him. He, he wasn't made a cardinal until very, very late in life, the last three or four years of his life. He was a, maybe 10 years of his life. He, was, he lived as a cardinal, but it was very delayed 
uh, in his. Did, didn't you share that he was persecuted a lot in terms of losing all his friends, his position? Well, that, that's certainly true. He, uh, once he became a Catholic, he could no longer teach at Oxford. You had to be an Anglican priest or an Anglican celibate active in the church to be able to hold a fellowship at, at any of the Oxford colleges in Newman's day. It has so, it very much changed today. And so he, yeah, so he lost a lot of friendships, some very close friendships that didn't want to go with him into the Catholic faith. Now, several of his very close friends did. So he did have friends all throughout his life that were lifelong friends, some very, very close and good friends. Newman was on his deathbed on two occasions in his life for uh, some travel sickness of some kind, something that he picked up. Might have been a touch of the plague, in fact. And both times his friends were what helped him carry through, praying for him, nursing him, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and also you wrote a book on Newman, Newman's philosophy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, I wrote a master's thesis at Oxford on the religious epistemology, there's a big word, religious epistemology of John Henry Newman. And epistemology is just a fancy way of saying um, the philosophy of how we think the way we develop our ideas, where we get our ideas from, how we uh, cog cognite, cognate <laughs> our, our ideas and thinking and how we form our thoughts and then how those thoughts become the expression of our speech and of our writing. So all of that is the study of epistemology and Newman... The origin of a thought. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Where do our ideas where come from? Come from? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an ancient part of philosophy. It goes back to Plato and Aristotle, and they, they each had very different ideas of that, that very thing. So Newman, um, in, in, the, in the world of Catholic theology, you can pretty much divide the history of Catholic theology into two camps. One camp very strongly influenced by Plato, philosopher, Greek philosopher, and the strongest theologian in that camp would be St. Augustine from the fourth and fifth centuries. And then the other one is Aristotle. Aristotle became very dominant in the Catholic history of Catholic philosophy and theology in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. And Thomas Aquinas is the primary exemplar of that tradition. These are two very different traditions, two very different approaches to epistemology and very different ways of expressing theological truth. It's the same theological truth, but it's just being expressed in different forms of language. Mm -hmm. So Newman um, was very influenced, we have to say, by both of those schools. So if you're looking for a good figure in the Catholic faith that sort of bridged St. Augustine and St. Thomas, Newman is a pretty good figure for that. Now, to be fair, I think he sides a fair bit more with Augustine and the Platonic tradition than he does with the uh, Aristotelian and Thomistic traditions. But, um, but he really made a strong effort. Once he became a Catholic, he became, he, he became a real student of Thomas Aquinas and of Aristotle. So um, yeah, Augustine's epistemology is generally labeled with the word phenomenology, or to use a more contemporary term, personalism. Personalism is the philosophy of John Paul II, for example, the great saint and pope. And uh, John Paul II learned a lot about personalism from St. John Henry Newman. Uh, now, personalism is just a, a fancy way of saying, or phenomenology is a fancy way of saying that I'm going to um, make my primary um, object of, my, of study the human person, not the cosmos out there, and not God necessarily as a human, as, a, as an individual, but I'm going to study primarily the human person as the human person experiences God and experiences the world. So in traditional philosophy, you would spend a lot of time just talking about the world, and you'd spend a lot of time talking about God, and the human person would be kind of an afterthought 
Newman reverses that, and the philosophers in his tradition, they reverse that by talking a lot about the human person. So it's the human person becomes the focus of study. So when you read John Henry Newman's philosophy, you're going to hear a lot about the human mind. Psychology? Yeah, a lot of it is psychology. You're right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're going to hear a lot about human emotion. You're going to mm -hmm. hear about human conscience. Conscience, right? that's where it comes from. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So we, we, we'll talk about... We'll talk about this next, next, next time. week. Next <laughs> well, we time. John need, Henry Newman, part we three. We need both, don't we? We need both. Yeah, we do. Yeah, talk absolutely. About, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think just one last thing, yeah. that um, when you focus on God first, which in my opinion is the proper orientation, yeah. then everything else that you study falls into place quite nicely. Sure. When you focus on the human person first, unless you really get that right, it can skew the way you look at God and the way you look at the world because it comes from our own experience which is very limited, we're finite, we're not perfect, mm -hmm. right? So that's the one, one problem with Newman's um, philosophy. However, Newman was such, a, um, such an orthodox theologian that he put some really good safeguards around his, mm -hmm. his personalism so that it really is. Just like these days, you can define whatever you want, your truth. It yeah, it's definitely, definitely not Newman's thing. No, us, definitely yeah. not Newman's thing. Okay, well, that's all we have time for. And Great. Yeah, we'll be back next episode. All right.